For precinct investment management, China represents a great opportunity. Buying into an emerging market with good growth potential and decade-low valuations, supportive policies, as well as great diversification. As the first asset manager in South Africa to be granted a qualified foreign institutional investor license by the China Securities Regulatory Commission, Prisian feels China is an opportunity too good to pass up. Liang Du, co-head of asset allocation at Prisian, joins me now from Cape Town. Liang, thanks very much for your time. Now, you make a very compelling case for why one should be looking at China. But explain for me, if China is currently valued at what the rest of the world is valued, is, is valued at in terms of uh, your overall markets, why should China go get the node ahead of the other markets? Um, I think, Godfrey, if you look around the world, China's going to be one of the places having some of the fastest growth over the next decade and two decades. Um, they're coming off a relatively low base. Their GDP per capita is still very, very low. And um, so if you look at environments around the world where China is uh, you know, it's not heavily burdened by debt as we are in the Western world, the developed world, um, you know, it has a lot more potential for growth, has supportive policies on the market um, to help the stock market. We've gone through a once in a decade leadership transition in China, so we're looking forward to more stability as well as policy that's greater for um, you know, good growth going forward. I think that what makes it interesting for us. Um, I think if you compare valuations, back in 2007, um, Chinese valuations were you know, three times the PE of South Africa. Right. So what that meant was that the, the market was pricing in a 15% higher growth for China relative to places like South Africa and the rest of the world for the next 10 years. Now that's absolutely crazy. <laughs> Today it's the other way around. Um, people are not pricing in any growth or any emerging market premium into China. Um, they're saying China's going to be just like the rest of the world, and yeah. I like those odds. Absolutely, but I suppose the fact that they are saying China is going to be like the rest of the world, perhaps isn't that a suggestion that perhaps uh, things are catching up with China? I mean, it's been growing at above 10% over the last three decades. What, I can't say guarantee, but what likelihood is there that the same kind of paces can be maintained in the years ahead, particularly taking into account what you've just said, that we've just seen a leader leadership change? Um, Godfrey, you bring up some very good points, and I think I can tell you straight away, over the next 10 years, you're certainly not going to see the growth we've seen in the last 10 years. Um, what you will see is a different type of growth. Um, so if you look at today um, of China, it really looks like Japan in the 1960s, where they started to move away from producing very, very cheap goods and very low on the value, um, delivering value, to moving up the value chain. They're going to deliver more higher quality goods, higher technology goods, and um, the doubling, focusing, the new policies are focused on the people of China. So it's doubling consumption in China. Um, and just like Japan in the 1960s, where they wanted to double GDP per capita over the next 10 years, yeah. China, given the new 10-year plan, have the same type of objectives where they're going to double the GDP per capita of China for the next 10 years. Okay, so let's talk about some of the issues that you raise in terms of why it's a good time to be investing in China. You speak of uh, low valuations, you speak of supportive long-term economic policies, and we have seen it uh, in the past few decades. You talk about encouraging short-term data. Let's drill into that in terms of just how encouraging that short data has been and what kind of a picture it paints for long-term growth. Okay, um, I think the short-term data, I think the fear last year was that China was heading for a um, hard collapse. Um, and what you've seen that inflation has come down dramatically in China, which allowed the Chinese government to create slightly more stimulative policies. Mm -hmm. um, not as much as they were before, but at least it has normalized. Um, I think, as you well know, the equity market's up about 20% in the last two months. And that's also a symptom of coming off very, very low valuations, and as well as seeing um, not a collapse in the growth, um, rather more stable growth going forward. Um, I think more importantly to me when you're talking about why you want to invest in China, I think there's two more benefits that people usually don't see. And the first one is that as a South African investor, the Chinese market has one of the lowest correlations um, mm. compared to any other asset you can add to your portfolio. Mm. So in terms of risk reduction, adding China in your overall portfolio um, reduces your risk by quite a lot. Yeah. The second thing that I think is also quite important, and it's a longer term trend that we will see for a long time coming, is that foreigners own so little of the Chinese capital market. Yeah. Um, so what you have spoken about, about the QFI license earlier on, um, foreigners currently own between 0.8% to 1.2% of the Chinese uh, market. Yeah. Now if you look at any developed markets, foreigners own roughly around 20 to 30% of the equities there. So there are a lot of pent up flows that cannot go in because of restricted um, you know, capital markets. Yeah. Um, a seminar MSCI recently had 
talked about what would happen if China opened up the equity market. And it was very interesting that that seminar was over-attended by almost three times. So people were very interested to know what would happen to the China weight in the benchmark yeah. should the Chinese market be opened up. And the answer there as well, over the next 10 or 15 years, should the market open up, the benchmark weight of China in global portfolios will rise dramatically. Absolutely. You use an important word there, if the market should be opened up. Now, well, therein, of course, lies one of the risks to investing in China. The the, I can't call it the uncertainty, but the possibility that some of the anticipated reforms and some of the changes that people are anticipating may well not happen. Let's discuss uh, political risk as well as uh, uh, regulatory risk. Um, you're absolutely right, and I think what's very encouraging to see is that the new leadership that's coming up strictly fall in the camp of opening up the market further. So if you look at all the actions China has taken in the recent period, starting from, let's say, allowing the currency to float more and more and more, um, allowing the, the, the establishment of the offshore RMB uh, program, the entire offshore RMB program was an attempt to internationalize the RMB, having multiple bilateral currency swaps with lots of other countries around the world, as well as opening up the QFI program, um, which of course we are a member of, and that's going to open up even further as we go along, mm. um, you know, growing that program by 400% over the next two or three years. Now that's an astounding number, and I think every single piece of policy China has come out with in the recent years have all shown that they're going more towards opening up rather than in the other direction. And I think we can take um, you know, a lot of that to heart and um, think that there's actually quite a low political risk um, as well as low regulatory list, where the regulators are more supportive of opening up mm. rather than the other way around. So let's speak about why the foreign ownership of Chinese equities is so low. Then. I mean, you speak of the 1% versus the 26%, 25%, and we know here in South Africa we're talking higher than 40%. Why is it so low? Is it a function, perhaps, of the regulatory environment, or are we talking here about people who are cautious about getting into Chinese equities? Oh, it's 100% because of the regulatory environment. Mm. Now, um, as you well know, the Chinese RMB is pegged to the US dollar. So if they open up their capital market and anyone can bring money in, they can no longer control their currency pegged to the US dollar. Right. So in order to maintain the peg to the US dollar and help their trade policies, what they had to do was close up their capital markets and not allow people to invest in their capital market. Mm. So that's why it's such a low percentage of foreign ownership in the Chinese market. Now, the RMB has strengthened by over 20% since they've stopped um, since they've kind of allowed a managed float to the US dollars. Um, with Chinese inflation higher than um, American inflation, what this means is that over the last seven or eight years, the RMB has actually appreciated in real terms by over about 40% relative to the US dollar, and it's heading more and more towards equilibrium levels. As the RMB becomes more t um, you know, normalized with equilibrium levels, yeah. the need to peg it is um, decreasing. So that helps them open up the capital market and eventually becoming, just like everyone else, having yeah. a much more free market and much more functional market. Liang, are you able to sort of draw a timeline for me so that we can help listeners who are watching the program understand perhaps what sort of timelines and time horizons we're talking about in terms of uh, that opening up of that market? <laughs> um, I think, you know, when, when you look <laughs> at um, Chinese government regulators, they tend to always move at a very cautious pace. Yeah. Um, so this is definitely not something that will happen overnight. You know, it's certainly right. not an overnight um, thing. Um, it's going to be a long-term thing, and I think so. people should not get their hopes up too much. I think, let's say, if we're going from half a percent or one and a half percent, and they're allowing it to be three yeah. percent, you know, it's going to be year after year after year after year. Um, but I would say, you know, on a 10-year time scale, with the gradual opening up, I think you know, it's, it's a reasonable time frame to look at, somewhere between 10 to 15 years, rather than someone thinking, oh, two years from now. Absolutely, important. So we're talking about the long term, yes, long term investing we're chatting about. Le we're talking, of course, top level about the overall Chinese market when you speak about uh, the low valuations. Within the sectors, where are you finding value? What are you looking at? Um, what, what we see, Godfrey, is that from our side, um, in China, picking sectors is very, very difficult. Yeah. So any sector that you think are going to do well, like the consumer sector or the pharmaceutical, yeah. already trade at a very, very high valuation. Um, what we found that investing in China, we don't even need to take risks in trying to guess the sector. Um, as a quantitative house, what we found that in China, there's 130 million retail investors in the market. Um, and what that causes is a layer of inefficiency in the market that allows you to have opportunities to create alpha without taking wild guesses in terms of sectors. Mm. So we have factors, let's say valuation factors, where cheap stocks continue to do better than the rest of the market while being sector neutral. Similarly, we have behavioral factors, where we find that Chinese stock investors tend to overreact on a massive scale. 
So by buying things that's fallen a lot and selling things that have risen a lot, yeah. you can create a lot of alpha without taking that type of risk. Absolutely. Go back to 2007 and you see a lot of that playing out. I wanted us to, to keep to this theme of just looking at the sectors. Now, you mentioned that the, the fact that China is moving away from this growth, this growth model where they were talking, where they are focused on uh, investing a lot in, in capital, so capital uh, investment based uh, development model, to now where some people are saying they are beginning to look at the consumer sector and trying to develop that Chinese consumer market. Would that not represent an mm -hmm. opportunity as well? Um, I think it, uh, it represents an opportunity, but at the same time, one has to always look at the valuation. Yeah. Right. So the perfect example I can bring out is let's say back in 2000, um, everyone talked about IT, and IT was certainly an opportunity. And if you think about technology companies from 2000 to now, they've done fantastically well. Unfortunately, had you bought technology company in 2000 when they had a ridiculous valuation, um, you would still not have made great amounts of money. And I think that remains the case for China as well, where you find that. Um, you know, the, the sectors that, you know, the consumer targeted sectors are trading at tremendously high valuations, whereas other sectors are trading at far better valuations and could still yet experience the same type of growth um, in the market. Yeah. Now, of course, like other parts of the world, investing in China, as we discussed earlier, carries its risks. And of course, one of those risks, though, is the fact that the Chinese market is not well known outside to, the, uh, to, to, to many in the outside world. Now, on governance, is, are there issues there that a potential investor looking at China, I'm talking about corporate governance here, uh, are there issues for someone who's looking at China to be concerned about or at least to take heed of? I think historically there definitely were issues in corporate governance. I think that has certainly been identified by the regulators in China. So if you look at the, um, the overhaul of their accounting standards in 2006 and 2007, um, shows exactly that, where they realize that they've historically had a lot of problems with corporate governance. So how the Chinese people tackled that was that in 2006 and 2007, what the Chinese government did is did an entire overhaul of the accounting systems to make sure that they have to report the right numbers and the right auditing numbers. Mm. Now the second thing they did to improve corporate governance was of course the privatization, or not necessarily privatization, but at least the listing of their, um, of their estate of enterprises. So what they've done is that they've listed state owned enterprises, they've made the numbers available to everyone, and they've you know, opened up free flow, selling shares off to other companies. And by doing so, they've imported a lot of you know, foreign skills as well as scrutiny onto their um, companies, which has improved corporate governance going forward. I think if you speak to the regulators in China, one of the things that they point out is that one of their targets is to restore confidence into their capital market. Mm. Exactly as you said, in 2007, um, we know when the bubble burst and a lot of them hurt the, Chi the confidence of Chinese capital markets. Mm. So the Chinese regulators are now regulating things very carefully. If you have a new IPO, for example, yeah. you have to explain exactly what you're going to use the money to do. You can't just go to the market and say, oh, I'm going to raise money just so that I could pay myself. <laughs>